Our speaker tonight is uh, Bill Kaufman, who, uh, as many of you know, is a uh, native of Batavia. Uh, he's an author of 11 books, uh, some of which uh, have won uh, some uh, prestigious awards. He wrote a screenplay for the 2014 movie, Copperhead. Uh, his writings have appeared in uh, numerous publications, including the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Los Angeles Times Book Review, The American Scholar, and The Spectator, which is a UK publication. Bill is a graduate of the class of 1977, Batavia High School and the University of Rochester. He worked as a legislative assistant to Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan and as an editor for several magazines and book publishers. Most importantly, he was the longtime vice president of the Genesee County Baseball Club, uh, which owned the Muck Dogs until recently. And he's one of the founders of the John Gardner Society. Bill lives in Elba with his wife, Lucene, the famous radio personality. And uh, they are the proud parents of a daughter, Gretel. Please join me in welcoming Bill. With the ninth pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Buffalo Bills select, uh, oh, wrong event, sorry. Thanks to Larry Friedman for inviting me. I met Larry when we did the Genesee County Bicentennial play in 2002. Uh, Larry had two roles. He's a very versatile actor. Uh, he played the groom of a talking horse at Batavia Downs, whose hapless racing record has put him on the fast track to hamburger meat. And he also played a sheriff in 1830s Batavia who threatens to shoot to kill those protesting the high rents charged by the Holland Land Office. Uh, it was good training for a district attorney, I think. Uh, in the same show, my wife Lucine, who is here tonight, played Mary Richmond, wife of Dean Richmond, the grand dame of 19th century Batavia. Lucine was quite good, of course, Though in retrospect, that piece of casting was probably a mistake, as she's been campaigning ever since to turn our humble abode into a mansion. Uh, and our daughter Gretel, who was eight years old at the time, played an Elba girl aspiring to be elected the tuber queen. Uh, that foreshadowed her eventual loss in the 2012 Onion Queen contest, uh, which Lucine still insists was fixed. No, actually, a friend of Gretel's one, I'm, I'm sure, was on the up and up. Uh, my mom, representing Leroy, lost the 1957 Onion Queen contest, so it's kind of a family tradition. <laughs> I wrote about that a bit in my book, Dispatches from the Muck Dog Gazette. And I was giving a talk once in Buffalo, and afterward, a woman came up to me and said, I'm the girl who beat out your mother for Onion Queen. She was a very nice lady from Alexander, wife of the legendary Buffalo News sports writer, Larry Felser. Uh, D.A. Friedman informed me that Law Day speakers are encouraged to keep their remarks under 15 minutes. And given the overwhelming imbalance uh, in here between the forces of order and the forces of disorder, I will gladly obey that injunction. I don't want to be singing, I fought the law on the law one. Our subject tonight is free speech. Like most writers, I'm more or less a First Amendment absolutist in favor of the widest possible freedom of speech and expression. In fact, I might take it one step further and actually require people to buy my books. Uh, they can resell them on eBay if they want for a nickel, I don't care. When I was a kid, there was a common expression. It's a free country, we'd say whenever someone tried to tell us what to do or what to think. You don't hear that much anymore, which probably speaks volumes about the way we live now, an age in which Kate Smith statues are toppled. But what do we use our freedom for anyway? To watch nasty videos online? To litter websites with vile and anonymous comments insulting strangers and people we've never met? That seems an awful waste of a precious freedom for which many thousands of Americans have fought and died. 
My first book, a novel, was published 30 years ago. I remember I received a box of author's copies from the publisher and brought one over to my parents. I signed it, gave it to them. My mom opened it and started reading. She got to about page five, and there's this um, explicit graphic scene. She starts crying. <laughs> I said, Ma, I never did anything like that, really. A guy told me about it. <laughs> Uh, that's probably why I haven't written a novel since. Words carry meaning, and they can have a cost, which refutes the Chris Christophersonian paradox that freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. So we have today, and I benefited from, greater freedom of expression, at least when it comes to frankness about sexual matters, than ever before. But in other more important ways, these freedoms are shrinking before our very eyes. And it's not big government, a la 1984, that is squeezing out our freedom of speech. It's big business, the tech companies, the cable networks, the Twitterverse. There are tremendous career and social pressures to toe the line, to go along with whatever the politically correct fad of the moment is, to keep your mouth shut. Well, it's our birthright and our obligation to defy these pressures to reject these censors and say what we think. The truth is there's always been a conflict in America between believers in the Bill of Rights and those who would squelch those rights. I've done a lot of reading lately for a project set during the First World War, and it's remarkable to discover the stories of the thousands of Americans who went to prison for criticizing that war 100 years ago. An Iowan named Walter C. Mahoney was sentenced to a year in Leavenworth for applauding an anti-draft speech. A Minnesota farmer named Abraham Sugarman said publicly, this is supposed to be a free country, like hell it is. He got three years in the pokey to think about that. I doubt he changed his mind. So the current assault on freedom of speech is nothing new. But on a more positive note, we're lucky to live in Batavia, in Genesee County. I really think the possibilities of freedom are greater here in a place like this than in a big city. I'm not just saying that as cheap boosterism or to get a kickback from the Chamber of Commerce. Our small or modest size is a real advantage. Life is lived here on a human scale, not a mass impersonal scale. We can actually know each other if we so choose. We don't need to snipe at one another anonymously over the internet. We can do so face to face. <laughs> But the funny thing is we don't do so face to face. Well, most of us don't. Uh, there are exceptions. Barbara Conable, the great man who represented us for 20 years in Congress before giving way to a series of uh, non-great men. Uh, Mr. Conable used to say that what he loved about growing up in Warsaw, living in Alexander, and representing Genesee and Wyoming counties in Congress was that you could form whole relationships with people here. You could understand others as complex, rounded, multi-dimensional people, not just flat one-dimensional cardboard cutouts. On TV or over the internet, that's all other people are, one-dimensional. They're not real. They're Democrat or Republican, gay or straight, progressive or conservative. You know and judge them only by this one identifier that really tells you very little about their true selves. You don't know them, you can't know them, and so we demonize those on the other side. We caricature them, we reduce them to a label, and the cycle of nastiness, the coarsening and vulgarizing of national discourse just keeps spinning down the drain. I don't see how we can get past that on a national level, it, it's all just too big. But at the local level, the level where we actually live, the picture is much brighter. Our daughter went to Elba Central School from kindergarten through high school, graduation. One wall of the school is lined with photos of old graduating classes. A lot of the same names and faces recur every generation. Only the hairstyles change. If you went to school somewhere other than Elba in the 1970s or 80s, you say, thank God my picture's not up there. Um, though there is a great senior class photo of Judge Chuck Zambito on that wall. 
I urge you all to visit Elba. Take a look at that. I'll tell you, he's gotten much more handsome over the years. <laughs> that wall of photos is a reminder to the kids walking those halls that they're a link in a chain. They're part of a tradition. Their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents are up there. Even those who don't have ancestors on the wall get a sense of belonging. They matter. They can't slip through the cracks. They're moored. They're anchored. They needn't be haunted by that terrible fear of anonymity that distorts the actions of so many of us. And so real community, the intricate network of relationships in which freedom of speech becomes meaningful, not just hot and angry air, is possible here. We really are blessed. I'm not saying kids who grow up in small communities are any better than kids who grow up elsewhere. There's a lot of hell raisers, as the police officers and sheriff's deputies present tonight can testify. But maybe at least we understand the backstory to these hell raisers. And that makes a difference. Of course, much of modern life militates against real community. Go to any high school, any college campus in America, and you see this army of zombies staggering around as if enslaved by this rectangular demon they're holding in their hands. These devices are changing us in fundamental ways, making us less aware of others, less human somehow. But that is a subject for Technology Day. <sighs> thanks for listening, and thanks to everyone who plays a part in this broad and sometimes poignant, often heartwarming, occasionally aggravating, but endlessly amusing pageant that is Genesee County. Thanks.